Hey, good morning, church. We're glad you're here today. Let's stand and sing this song called House of the Lord. And before we do that, let's pray. God, we are so thankful to be in your house today. We are thankful to be with those who believe and those who claim Jesus Christ as their Savior. We're thankful to worship. And there's joy in our hearts because of who you are and what you have done. things in store. Sir, I'm going to grab your music stand here, and I may or may not return it. I may or may not steal all of your music, and you may or may not be mad at me later. (laughs) So, the great song to start it off this morning, and speaking of joy, here's where we're headed for Advent this year. If you were with us last year for Advent, we had a resource that we 
were able to make available. There was a small cost to it. This year we have a resource as well, and this is kind of where we're going to go with it. The cost is even less, and in fact, if you can't afford it, by all means, just take one. But right now, here's what we have. Advent's going to start on November 28th. That's the first Sunday of Advent. And this year we're running with a theme called The Dawning of Indestructible Joy. It's a small devotional that John Piper put out a number of years ago, and we're not going to exactly teach out of the book, but we're going to teach out of the themes of the book as we go through Advent. One of the really neat things I felt last year as we engaged it with our family in the book that we had last year, um, and even our worship team were able to put the song together with it, was just a, a sweet time. But I encourage you as a family, consider to just pick up a book. We have 20 copies right now. The suggested, it's just suggested donation is $4. Normally there are quite a bit more than that, but we nabbed a really good deal thanks to our secretary, Dawn, who found it. It's like, yes, jump on it. We got them for $4 each. So it's just a suggested donation that just all it does is pay for the cost of the book. There's a plate there if you want to drop it in. If you feel like, hey, I don't have money and you want to give money later, not a big deal. The bottom line is what we're really after is as a church family, as followers of Christ, we can engage in this stuff together. If you're not normally part of this church and you're just visiting, go ahead and take one. It doesn't matter whether you're here or elsewhere. Engage in this with your family. There's one devotional reading per day. We did it with our family last year. We intend to do it again. We actually, this is something we shared with our neighbors. We're going to do that again this year as well. The readings start on December 1st, and so we just want you to make sure you have those in your hands as well, okay? So those are available. They're on the table as you leave the sanctuary here this morning. So that is announcement number one. Number two I want to share a passage of Scripture, and it's going to tie in where we're going at this morning, and then I want to do a little acknowledgement. But in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, it's right near, it's the night before Jesus' crucifixion. He's with his disciples, and this is the moment when he, he engages them, he, he challenges them, and says, guess what, I'm going away and if you remember, they say, hey, I don't know where you're going. And Jesus says, how can you not know where I'm going? You've been with me this whole time. And he says to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm a very well-known passage of Scripture. And that's going to fit in with where we're at today. But he, following that, after he speaks to the, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and this is leaving the disciples, the 12, extremely troubled because this is the guy they've been following this whole time. And we find then, as we wrap it up near the, near the end of that chapter, in chapter 14, starting at verse 25, he says, All this, all of these things I have spoken to you while I was with you, including this Sermon on the Mount that we're going to be finishing up today. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, as Chris talked about last week, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all the things. And he's going to remind you of everything that I have said to you. And then he says these words. He says, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Those are encouraging words from our Savior Jesus Christ as we look at engaging the conclusion of this Sermon on the Mount. But I was thinking as we look at that, the idea of peace. And in this world, if you look at the politics, you look at the television, you look at the newspapers, whatever, wherever you find your information, our world is far from at peace. And it, I recently read several, actually, World War II books. And what was astounding is just the history of World War II. I mean, the complexity and the sacrifices that were made. But in looking at this past Thursday, Veterans Day, an Armistice Day, which actually was the beginning of Veterans Day, the, on the 11th of November, so the 11th day of the 11th month at, a, at the 11th hour, there was a peace. And it was at that time when it was signed, it was believed that this was going to be the peace for all time, really, because they believe that this is the end of this war that was supposed to end all wars. And we're human. We know that that didn't take place. You know, war is a difficult thing. War brings death, struggle, maiming. War brings hardship and pain and loss and grief. And there's no argument against any of those realities. Yet even Solomon understood this, and we read this in the scriptures, that there are in fact times for war and times for peace. Yet I think that we know that the heart of God is for peace. We see it in the words of Jesus Christ. And he wants peace for all of his people. And as we approach Advent... 
We celebrate the Savior. We celebrate Emmanuel. We celebrate the Prince of Peace. Peace and goodwill to men on whom his favor rests. And so why do we fight? Why do we conflict? Why do we have war? We stand and we fight against evil. We do not fight for our own selfish gain as we look at the world conflicts, as followers of Christ in particular. We stand against Satan and evil, and we fight for the heart to bring peace. So the armistice, November 11th at 11 a.m. on 1918, the peace treaty signed the end of the war that would end all wars, and yet it did not end all wars. The greater wars have even taken place, and yet in the anomaly, we fight for peace. We want to recognize today those who have served this country as soldiers against evil and as, and as ambassadors for peace. And thus, if you are a veteran, I would just ask that you stand and be recognized for your efforts as an ambassador for peace as well as uh, a soldier against evil. Thank you. Thank you for your service in standing against evil and being an ambassador for peace. One other announcement I think I had. Let me find my stuff here if I haven't lost it. Here we go. And then we're going to transition. So if you look in the back of your worship folders, last Sunday was the beginning of our Missions Emphasis Month, and that's continuing on today, and we have a snapshot coming in for you today. Um, so, Amanda, would you come on up? Amanda Voth has a ministry that we as a church actually help support her in. You may or may not be aware of that. And she's going to share a little bit more on that for us, what her role is, as well as what that ministry is doing and some cool things going on there. Amanda? Hello.
So I just want to thank you for your support over this time. Thank you, Amanda. So one of the cool things with this is, whether you realize it or not, we have a number of people who engage in ministry in a lot of different arms and avenues that are part of this local church. And many of you who maybe don't know Amanda personally maybe had no idea the ministry that she has. But what a cool thing, really, that we can find in our culture now. It's so odd where so remotely Amanda can have such a long arm, a long reach, and you're not that tall. (laughs) <laughs> whatever answer. Thank you for you three who laughs at that. Uh, but but there is, you, you think of that. It's like what a, what a because of technology and using those things, what a, a, a reach into ministry. That's, that wouldn't have happened before. And even like Amanda said, in the last year and a half, it's like talk about a challenging time to be doing this, and yet you see God using Amanda and what she does to orchestrate these things. Hey, the Lord is at work. Let's never forget that. And let's just continue to engage in him with that. So I'd like to pray for Amanda, pray for her ministry. So would you join me as we pray? Lord, I thank you for One Collective. I thank you for what they're doing. I thank you for the ministry and for this story that was shared. Lord, we see your hand at work. Even in these times, it's just like, how in the world is this all going to work out? And yet you and your Holy Spirit, you orchestrate these things so intricately, so beautifully. We can't help but praise you and acknowledge your your presence and your leadership and your authority in that. And so we give you thanks for that. I pray for a blessing on Amanda as she continues to engage and lead these trips. Though they are being done in a creative way, I ask that you'll use her to spread this gospel. Even if she's got this long distance and the, the relationships that are built, they will be lasting, but they will proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever these people go. And however that these things are met, Lord, you are doing great and amazing things. Thank you that we get to be a part of it. And I can ask that you continue to use Amanda in this glorious way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Amanda. Next week, we will be transitioning. We'll have uh, missionaries, Chris and Dave Manfred, who will be joining us for the weekend. So make a note on the back of your worship folders. That schedule is on there. Great schedule for next weekend in particular. We got some really cool things going out to the Mueller's home. What is, Caitlin, what's that place called? Meadowview Manor, okay? So that's where one of these missions events, we're going to have an authentic Cambodian dinner. Unless, of course, everything falls through, then we're having tacos. Uh, (coughs) I'm sure it'll be fine, right? Otherwise, we just we th- we'll call it Cambodian, and we just though it'll be tacos. Uh, Cambodian dinner out at Meadowview Manor is really going to be. It's a beautiful place. You're not going to want to miss that. So just make note of that on those other events that are happening on the back of your worship folder. So we're going to transition. Today is the day that we are finishing up our Sermon on the Mount series. As we've engaged with this, it's been clear that Jesus has come in and He's raised the bar. As we started off with the the Beatitudes and we look at the engagement that he had with the people and the crowds that he had there, he has raised the bar. He has made it higher. That which seemed already impossible, he's made it all the more impossible. And as anyone who's listening to what Jesus is saying, you got to be going like, you got to be kidding me. What hope do I have? And yet that's where I think we're going to really come to the crux of the matter this morning and understanding what is our role. Because all throughout this, we keep talking about the same phrase, the same thing, and that is Jesus has come and he wants to change the hearts. He engages the people of the Sermon on the Mount and his purpose is, you guys got to understand this, you can't do the right things to get over the bar. Something different has to happen and that's why I came. And he keeps hammering that, hammering that, hammering that, and it's all about this heart change. And let's be honest. As we engage our lives and our living, I recognize that my heart needs to change in a lot of ways. And yet I feel powerless to be able to change my heart. And that's what I think we're going to be addressing today. I feel powerless to change my heart. So how in the world is my heart going to be changed? And that's what we're going to see today. So we're actually going to get started here. And what I'm going to start with is the final two verses of Matthew chapter 7. And that's a little bit confusing because it seems like it should be building up to those final two. But I think what I really want us to see and understand in these final couple of verses in Matthew chapter 7, it reflects on everything that we've just looked at. 
So all of that from Matthew chapter 5, all of that from Matthew chapter 6, and then we look at, those are all words of Christ as he's delivering this sermon, but it's important to note what we see here in verses 28 and 29, because not only do they relate, but they actually validate that which we've already studied and that which we're going to look at today. So this is what it says in Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse 28 and 29, the very last two verses of this chapter. It says, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, when he had finished delivering this Sermon on the Mount, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. I mean, he had taught some powerful things. These are things that they hadn't really heard. In other words, he, you kind of exemplified how this high standard just got higher. That's amazing in itself. But it's verse 29 in particular, it says, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. The people that were listening likely were Jews, if not all Jews, they very well could have been. And that whole dynamic of it, and so they would have known what Jesus was teaching on when he referred back to scriptures and such. They would have had this knowledge of it. They would have heard them before. And so much so, in fact, that even as they had heard the scriptures, they would have had these Pharisees and teachers of the law who would have taken these scrolls and these documents that they had and opened them up to them and explained it to them. But what's interesting is there's a contrast that took place between how Jesus is delivering this message and the same, some of the same phrases and words that have been said before when he says, you've heard that it's said, but I tell you this. But they had switched it. So the Pharisees would have looked at this and the teachers of the law would have looked at the original documents and they would have looked at God as the authority on these documents. And so they would have you know, emphasized that aspect in these documents. But they would have also quoted other rabbis who would have had some insights and thoughts on it. So they're quoting other people. But the ultimate person of authority in these documents, as these teachers of the law are trying to express is, it is God. God is the authority. Well, Jesus comes onto the scene and he actually presents all that we've studied so far and what we're going to hit on today is like, I'm first person speaker. I mean, this would have been, in other words, let me quote from the great teacher myself as opposed to from the great rabbi. You, you follow? And so the way Jesus approached this, and we lose it in our, because we're reading it in the scriptures, but the, the hearers, the first hearers would have been astounded. It's like, wait a minute. You're not quoting any of the rabbis. You're speaking as if, you spoke this. You follow? You're speaking as if you wrote this. And in reality, he did. You know, not, not literally, you know, pen in hand, but he was the author. He is the authority. Wrote word of authority, author. He wrote the story. And that's where people have recognized it as Jesus is teaching this stuff. This is jaw-dropping. Wait a minute. So you're actually saying you, you're the one, as the listeners, you're the one that did this? I mean, you're the one that spoke this? In other words, you're like, you're acting like you're God incarnate. And that's exactly who he was. And that gives not only authority, but that gives a strong emphasis as we look at what Jesus is now saying, coming from the actual mouth of God himself. It should cause our ears to perk up. It's like, okay, if God's got a message to us in the Sermon on the Mount, we better listen. Okay, so that's, that's really, it, it brings in and really emphasizes the, the validity of what it is that we've been looking at and studying. But as we look at this idea of changing heart, we've studied this from Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and now chapter 7. God wants to change our hearts, but you know where you're at. I mean, how many times it's like, I've got this problem, I've got this sin, I've got this struggle, and it just, it's relentless. It's something that kind of keeps coming up. Maybe it's an addiction. We always have this area, maybe it's, it's pride, whatever, whatever kind of keeps rearing its ugly head. It's like, I thought I dealt with this. I thought it was in the past. How in the world is my heart ever going to change? It feels hopeless to ever have my heart change. Paul writes about it. We find ourselves doing that which we don't want to do. We love Jesus, and yet we do the things that we don't want to do. And this is what Paul writes in Romans chapter 7. He says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. This law is this message from God. It's just as Jesus has spoken as the author. He said, this, this law that God has given to us, it's like, it's spiritual, but I am such a wreck. I can't even come close to clearing that bar. I can't even come close to matching what this law says. Sold as a slave to sin, I do not understand what I do. Can you relate to that? As you live this life and this struggling life, I 
can't understand that why I do what I do. For what I want to do, I don't do. But that which I hate, those are the things that I do. And if I do what I don't want to do, I agree that the law is good. And as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but sin that is living in me. We're going to be talking about that sin aspect this morning. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but in my own strength, I added that part, I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. That is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin that is living in me. Jesus wants to deal with the sin. Jesus came to deal with the sin. So I find that this law is at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there within me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I, can, I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? In other words, I am so wretched, there's no way I can have the righteousness that Jesus just talked about in this Sermon on the Mount. There's no way that I can have that righteousness to get over that bar. But thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, your Lord. Thanks be to God because he's the one that can carry me over. And that's where we're going to get at today. So we're going to jump into it here. So this is what we find. We're going to have kind of these three sections in the rest of Matthew chapter 7. We're going to have this narrow and wide gate stuff. We've heard about that perhaps in the past. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then we go into this wolf in sheep's clothing dynamic. And we're going to have, we're actually going to see that there's people that are intentionally trying to pull people away. Now I think that there's an evil that's going on there. We'll talk more about that. And then he concludes this message with a parable. And it's an interesting parable because sometimes we take that parable to be a little bit more literal than maybe we should, but it points to a reality that's going to lead us to where it is that we need to go this morning. So here we go. We left it off before. Chris, Pastor Chris kind of led us through that, which was really good. Now we're up to verse 13. He says, enter, Jesus says, enter then through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. You know, we have this contrast to a narrow and a wide gate. The narrow gate is so small that basically you can barely fit through it. In other words, there's some people that just won't fit. Don't take that too literal as far as my my description of that, because some people will skew my words. It's not the intent. The intent of it is is there's a narrow gate that few will find, and then there's a wide gate. But what's interesting, we look at our culture. What is the narrow gate? What is the wide gate? I think sometimes we, we like to think that the gate is maybe wider than we think. Jesus said himself, we already talked about that, there is only one way, and it says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We looked at that. We know which gate is the way. And yet there's this wide gate that's attractive because the wide gate is very permissive. The wide gate is very allowing. Yeah, we have freedom in Christ, but there's an interesting aspect to it because the the wide gate wants us to be convinced and believe that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe it. That's the wide gate. It doesn't matter who you follow as long as you follow them wholeheartedly. That's the wide gate. Our culture is, let's be honest, is really trying to hammer and convince us that the gate is pretty wide. Jesus speaks opposite. We may be uncomfortable with that reality, but he speaks the opposite. He says the gate is actually quite narrow. I've tried to think of a good illustration of this. I really can't come up with anything aside from what Jesus is really laying out here. And he's going to go into it with, with what's coming up next, but this, the wide gate is easy. The wide gate justifies sin. And the narrow gate says, there's no room for you to get through and still hold on to your sin. Does that make sense? So as if a rock, this, this will, for the time being, demonstrates my sin, okay? As I'm carrying the rock, the, the gate is just too narrow. I can't get through the gate and still hold on to 
my sin. Jesus has to do something with that. I have to let him do something with that. I can't fit through the narrow gate unless I let him do something with that. That's kind of the idea of the narrow gate. But we some, some we think that the wide gate allows me to go on through this and I get to keep this. I don't have to deal with that. Whatever that sin is, whether it's addiction and pride, I mean, there's so many. And I think we just, we tend to say, I don't want to think about my sin because then I have to do something about it. I'm guilty of that. I think every one of us are because that's the wide gate. That's the easy way. So just understand the contrast of it. And then we shift. And so he's kind of laid out this picture of this wide gate and this narrow gate. And he says, narrow and few, he says, will find it. But wide is the path that leads to destruction. And you can go that way. It looks like the easy way, but it's not going to get you to the destination that Jesus is promising. So then we find he, he, Jesus is going to go on and he's going to lay out this, basically this picture of people who are trying to, if you will, lead people, hey, it's okay to go through the wide gate. Right? He doesn't say that exactly, but that's kind of the picture that we have here. So Jesus, he backs off and he says, okay, now watch out. There's a wide gate, there's a narrow gate. Narrow is the way to life. Wide is the gate for destruction. Now watch out because there's going to be people that are going to try to lead you down the wide gate. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. It, they are wolves in sheep's clothing. In other words, they are there to devour you. They are there to mislead you. They are there to get you to not focus on Jesus, focus on yourself, focus on whatever it is that you want to do. The wide gate says, enjoy and do whatever you want to do. The narrow gate says, I have something better for you. And he says, watch out. There's false prophets that are going to say the wide gate is okay. You'll get there, and it's easier. But it's just wolves in sheep's clothing. Jeremiah 23 talks about these false prophets, and this is the picture that we have. If you remember the, the uh, prophecy of Jeremiah, there was when, when Israel excuse me, was exiled. They were exiled for 70 years, and there were some prophets who were saying, don't worry about it. This is just really short and really temporary. We're going to be right back, back into uh, Israel, right back into Jerusalem in no time. So you just hang in there, not a big deal. And Jeremiah is getting the message from God saying, no, it's going to be 70 years. That's what God said. And I think it was Hezekiah said, no, that's, that's not what it is. It's just this really short, short time. And this is what Jeremiah says in response to that. He says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. It's easy to justify an easy way. Jesus is going to hit us with some hard words this morning. Are you ready to receive these hard words and then to do something about them? And that's what we'll talk about that at the end as far as what to do. So, but, so he talks about there's these wolves in sheep's clothing. Sometimes we don't necessarily know who's the wolf Who's an actual sheep? You, know, you follow? What, what, where are we at here? And Jesus says, you can know. And this is how he lays it out. He says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. It's very interesting. So this is a, this is a tree. I'd like to tell you what the name of the tree is. I can't pronounce the name of this tree. Okay, but I'll tell you a little bit more about it in just a moment. But the idea of it is, what kind of tree produced this? Banana tree. I don't know if there's really a banana tree over at the bush. I really don't know. I'm not, I'm not a horticulturalist, okay? I just, I just play one on TV, okay? So like a banana tree. And this one, of course, is an apple tree, right? That one I do know is a tree. Oranges, do they grow on trees or is that a bush? I don't know. And this is an onion tree, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Some of you are saying, wait a minute, there's no onion tree. What are you talking about? But the idea of it is a, a good banana tree is going to produce good bananas, right? That's how it works. Can, can a banana tree produce an acorn? I hope not. An oak tree produces acorns. You, you follow? You can identify even what the tree is based on what kind of fruit it's providing. Did this come from an apple tree? 
No, granted, you've got you to hand it to some scientists now because they can combine most anything, right? But do you understand the point? You can recognize whatever tree it is based on its fruit. What's interesting about this unnameable tree is it's got a fruit, and actually, it's very much the size of about the apple. It doesn't really look like an apple, but, it, but you know, I don't really know what it would feel like. But this, this what's significant about this tree, this is the only fruit that this tree produces. But this fruit on this tree is highly poisonous. In fact, it's toxic. So much so that they actually, uh, ancient tribes would actually use this fruit and they would put it onto their arrows as a poison to kill their enemies. This is the fruit where I believe they get cyanide from. It's, don't eat it. But do you follow? But by looking at it, it's like, oh, there's, there's fruit on that tree. Maybe it's good for consumption. That tree can only produce bad fruit. Likewise, an apple tree can only produce apples. Do you, do you follow what Jesus is getting at? You can identify that which is true based on the fruit that it's providing. And we look at that, well, how do we know if it's good fruit? Unless we taste it, I might be dead. I think Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit to be able to identify that even as we go on. But that's, it's an important thing to note as we look at this. And here's a way to be able to decide and to, to differentiate powerful passage of scripture we look at this and we memorize parts of these passages of scripture in this one here in Galatians 5 but do you really understand the depth of it because you got to ask yourself as we engage this we just looked at the wolves in sheep's clothing and they will be known by the fruit that they bear you, you can identify it's easy to say okay I can look at your fruit and your fruit okay you're kind of a banana you're kind of an apple and no one here is a cyanide okay I gotta get that but oftentimes do we look at the kind of fruit that we're producing in a real honest light? Am I producing good fruit? And then, and then we fall in, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Then we fall in and say, okay, well, I got to do better. I got I to produce better fruit. And when we fall into that, I think we're missing the point of what Jesus is really getting at. And we'll get to that. But in Galatians 5, it says, you, my brothers and sisters, you're called to be free. Right? You're, you're called to, to not fall under the, the obligation of the law. You're called to this freedom. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping with this one command, to love your neighbor as yourself. You want to try to identify the fruit, and not only yourself, but someone else. First and foremost, look at love. Does this person genuinely love the people around them? Do you? And I'm not saying, oh yeah, I love everybody. Unless they cut me off on the road, then I'm angry. Come on. Do you love those who are around you? Do you express love to them? We kind of can sweep that off and say, oh yeah, yeah. Do you? If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. What is that a picture of? That's a picture of bad fruit. If you bite and devour each other, I've watched it. You know, for, for many years, and whether it's in churches, in schools, Christian schools, whatever, especially in it, you see it in the middle school, no matter what middle school you go at, anywhere. Okay, Bite, biting and devouring is quite literal, I think. But beyond that, I've watched it as believers in particular will bite and devour each other. That's heavy. That is not, that is not the picture that Jesus has for his church. He wants to produce good fruit, and if it's producing bad fruit, it cannot stay. It has to be dealt with. And we're going to talk about that. So he say, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In other words, Lord, I want to produce good fruit. I don't know how to produce good fruit. What do I have to do? He says, walk by the Spirit. I don't exactly know what that means. We'll get to that. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Does this not echo what Paul had wrote in Romans chapter 7? They're in contrast to each other. They're in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. 
But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. In other words, the bad fruit is very visible. It's obvious. So don't justify it, but it's sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. Boy, that covers a lot of it right there. Selfish ambition, does it not? Dissension, factions and envy and drunkenness and orgies and the like. I mean, that covers, if you have a sin, it's going to fit into one of those categories kind of guaranteed. And if you think you don't have any of those categories, I think you're, you're sadly mistaken. We look back at what Paul said, what a wretched man I am. There I am. I know that in my life there is bad fruit that is produced. It sickens me, and yet it's there. It appalls me, and yet sometimes I feel like, what else can I do? And we'll get to that. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That fits really well with what Jesus is talking about here in the Sermon on the Mount. But... And this is the part we have all of our kids memorized because we all want them to be kind and gracious and all that stuff, right? So then we can, we can make them memorize it and then we can say when they've been wrong, when they've been unkind, we say, well, now what's the fruit of the Spirit? And then they will regurgitate it back to them. Now, is that how you're acting? And they will say, yes. And they'll say, no, that's not how you're acting. Then you have to correct them. And then you get on to the say, oh, all the whole hap- uh, family is happy. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, first and foremost. It is joy. It is peace. Patience or forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's good fruit. If that's being produced in you, you're not doing it. If that's being produced in you, that's the Holy Spirit producing that in you. That is so important to note. Bad fruit comes from when we produce things on our own. Good fruit comes when the Spirit is producing it within us. I think that's an important distinction. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, or envying each other. And then Jesus gives these very challenging words. These are uncomfortable words. But it fits with what he's talking about with these wolves in sheep's clothing. Hear this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And stop right there, because we look at that sometimes like, wait a minute, I know that there's so many times I haven't done God's will. Am I ruined? Am I wrecked? My answer is no. There's grace and there's mercy. We're going to get into what the will of God actually is here in just a moment. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In other words, didn't I not tell how people could get to heaven through the wide gate? Did I not drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles? Didn't I do that? He says, then I will tell them plainly, I didn't know you. And Chris touched on this last week briefly in regarding to the Holy Spirit as well. And he says, away from me, you evildoers. Do you know Christ? Do you have a relationship with him? Do you know him? And then he he concludes this message with this parable. And then we'll kind of wrap it up here just afterwards. But in this parable, then he says, so therefore, anyone who hears all these things that I've been saying in the Sermon on the Mount, if you've heard this message that I put out there, including this idea of being careful of the wolves in sheep's clothing, he says, who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, is like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. So everyone who would have heard this message would have known, yes, it's wise to build your house on a sturdy foundation. It's, that's a good idea. And so everyone who heard that would have recognized, oh yeah, that shows great wisdom. He's not calling out some of them as being foolish because they've built their house on sand, which sometimes we think that maybe that's where he's going. That's not where he's going. He's exemplifying this, oh yeah, I get what you're saying there. If you take these words that I have taught you, you put them into practice, guess what? That is a wise decision, and it's like building your house on a firm foundation, on the rock. The rains will come down, the streams will will rise, and the winds will blow and beat against the house, and yet it will not fall because it had the foundation that was on the rock. In other words, if you look at what Jesus says, who is the authority? It's like, okay, I want to follow what it is that he is saying. I want to trust him in that way. I know that that is broad. 
it's like this firm foundation building that's like, okay, I have something that can, I can stand on. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man saying, the gate is wide. Oh, this is such a sandy spot. I'm going to build my house here because it looks really, really good. I know Jesus said this, but I really want to live this way. I know Jesus said that's not a good way to live, but guess what? I really enjoy it. I'd rather stay here. I'm going to just continue down this path instead. It's more comfortable. It's easier. I don't have to change anything. I can justify my heart's presence in that way. Do you you follow? It's like hearing what Jesus says. It's like, yeah, I believe what you say, but it doesn't apply to me. It's like a man who builds his house in the sand. The rains came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house, and that fell with a great crash. So what is it that we do? We've looked at Jesus. He raised the bar higher. What's our responsibility? If Jesus is the one that changes our hearts, what is my role? What do I do? He's got to do this work. There's a word that comes to my mind, and it's repent. Jesus, throughout the scriptures, calls mankind to repent. Remember in Revelation chapter 3, as we went through it, Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come. I've used the illustration before. It's one that I just cannot get over because I I apply it to my life. I try to apply it to my life on a regular basis. Some of you maybe haven't seen it or or heard me share it. It wasn't my own creation. I heard it from a pastor in South Dakota, which is a wonderful place, much better than North Dakota. Um... I know. I only say that because some of you are from North Dakota and you just hate it when I do stuff like that. I'm so sorry, Betty. Last time you were here, I did the same thing, didn't I? I don't mean it. I don't mean it. I don't mean it. Love North Dakota. Go bison. Okay. But here's the, I heard it from a pastor in South Dakota. It just, this pictures it. In our life, you know, you, you, you tend the ground if you're a farmer, any farming background. If you grew up in the Midwest, you know what I'm talking about because you see it on your dirt roads, Okay. You have weather like this, where it got wet and cold, and that water seeps down into the ground, and then it freezes, while water expands when it freezes, and it starts pushing some things up. You see it a lot of times in the spring, where all that winter water and kind of settled in there in spring, and then you keep getting that that pushing up, that water sinks down lower, and it pushes up, it pushes up, it pushes up, and pretty soon, farmers in their field every spring... I remember my friends in high school always talking about, oh, we're going to go pick rock this weekend. I'm thinking, look at you. <laughs> I'm not because I don't have a farm, okay? And then when I did, I got paid for it, which was very seldom. You got one penny a rock. Sweet, sweet. Whatever, I made that up. <laughs> but the idea of it is the water, it just keeps rising these things up. You can't tell me you live your life. It's like there's no rocks in my life. I can walk through that narrow gate any time I want. Uh uh-uh. uh. As I get up every morning, I find that the Lord, I wake up, it's like, seriously? You're bringing something else to my mind? Now I've got to deal with it? And some of these rocks are heavy. And so to, to pass through the narrow gate, it feels like somehow I think that if I, this is all I can carry. I had Brody take the two big ones here and help me out earlier. But like as we're going through life, it's like, if I'm going to live this life and deal with my sin on my own, this is what I'm doing. I'm carrying them on my own. And that's if the Lord's brought them to my attention. Sometimes I may have a big bag of rocks trailing behind me, and I don't even realize that they're there. Or I try to pretend that they're not, and they just weigh you down. But as we go through this life, these rocks keep popping up. And Jesus is basically saying, this is sin in your life. What are you going to do with it? I kind of like it. It's weighing you down. I know, but it's really hard to give up. If this one's kind of pretty, what are you talking about? It's gray and ugly. I know, but it's really, I'm really attached to it. What are you going to do with it? And then somehow we think that, well, maybe if I just, you know, I can't really, I'll, I'll switch it. I'll hold it in this hand for a while. You know, that, that's our effort to try to deal with it. To try to quit, to try to try to deal with our addiction. Well, I'll just I'll switch hands for a while. Now I'll, I'll be I'll be okay. I can go a few more steps. And we still find ourselves getting tired. I can't do it. So what does Jesus ask you to do? Here's the sin in your life. What are you going to do with it? There's a word. It's repent. 
You know, the word repent, basically it refers to, and I know it's, it's been talked a lot, it, it's a 180. And I hear that, and I understand that, and that, that's, that's not wrong, it's true. It's like you're heading in this direction, and it's like you repent, you actually turn and go in this direction. I think there's an aspect to that, but we look at that as being a one time and one and done. There, I've done that. But as the Lord brings up sin in your life, as these things kind of keep popping up from season to season, he's just in constant efforts to help you. Hey, you still got this. Will you repent of it? And when we repent, like they do in South Dakota, they take the rock, they lay it in this pen, usually a cage, that's oftentimes at the corner of their field. And it holds up the fence. You know what I mean? It's got these big pillars almost of rocks. It's like a big pile. Sometimes my neighbor growing up, he was a farmer. He had a huge pile of rocks right in the middle of his field. Why he put it in the middle, I don't know, but that's what he did. Huge pile of rocks. Every spring it would get bigger. That's where we put the rocks. That's where we put the rocks. That's where we put the rocks. To repent says, hey, you've got sin in your life. He's shown it to me. All right. I need to get my eyes off the sin, do my 180, and get my eyes onto him. Because what does he want? Does he want me to produce a life of rocks? Or does he want me to produce a life of fruit? I know it's an onion. It's a vegetable. A life of fruit. I'm not that dense, okay? The man held an onion, and then he said it was a fruit. <laughs> He's a fruit. Do you see the picture? Jesus doesn't want us to walk around carrying a bunch of rocks. You can't get through the narrow gate that way. It's not our work, but we have a responsibility. The heart change isn't our work, but we have a responsibility. My responsibility is when the Lord says, hey, you've got sin in your life. My responsibility isn't to say, yeah, but I'm going to keep it. I'm going to justify it. My responsibility says, you know, you're right. I'm going to repent of that. I'm going to get my eyes back on you. That is true for everyone. Whether you've been a follower of Christ for a day, whether you've been a follower of Christ for 50 years, you have regular times when you need to say, Lord, I'm still dealing with this. I'll tell you, pride. If any one of us goes through a year without pride, how'd you do that? You're dead? Did that what you said? <laughs> You're dead. That's good. Do you see? So the challenge of it is, or the question of it is, I want the Lord to produce good fruit in my life. I don't want to walk around with this anymore. I want to repent of this. Lord, you got to, this is, I got to set it down. I repent of it. I get my eyes back on you. Now you, Lord, produce the fruit that you want to produce, the good fruit. When we look at the message on the Sermon on the Mount, what's the will of God? We had that. Only those who do the will of God can enter into the kingdom of heaven. I'm convinced that the will of God is that we repent from our sin. Will you repent from sin that you are being confronted with today? Has the Lord brought up some rocks in your life that's like, I got to deal with that? You know they're there. Don't ignore them any longer and say, Lord, take it from me. I repent of it. Get my eyes back on you. Help me. I can't do it alone. It's going to come back up. It's going to, more rocks are going to come. And as they come, Repent from them. Repent, repent, repent. I'm going to invite Lane and the worship team to come up. I'm going to try to put Sarah's stand back to where, where it was. Reflect on that. What is the Lord calling for you in regards to repentance this morning? This is a time to, to not only celebrate that, that Jesus wants to produce good fruit in us and wants to deal with this sin. I mean, that's a, that's a beautiful picture of mercy and grace. But there's also, it's a time to be solemn. Because he wants to deal with some of these things, and some of these things might be really hard for us. They might be something we've struggled with a long time. We recognize it. It's time to at least take the first step, and we do have a responsibility, and let's repent from it. I say, Lord, I can't do it. I need you to do it. That's our responsibility. Will you do it? Let's stand in the church and sing some songs. First song is Jesus Only, No Holding Back.
sanctifier, he's our healer, and he's our coming king. And he's come to deal with the rocks of sin in our life. We have a responsibility. Will we repent of them? And he wants to create and generate within us good fruit. What repentance do you need to engage in him with this morning? Don't justify it and leave without dealing with it. And then be ready for whatever he has to produce in you and ask, Lord, will you produce that good fruit in me? It's your work to do inside. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you that you are so faithful to deal with the sin and the stones of sin in our lives that you keep raising to the surface as uncomfortable and as much as we maybe dislike it and hate it and want to justify it. Thank you for that work. Thank you also for the work that you want to produce in us good fruit. Lord, our response has to be submitting to you and recognizing that you are the only one who has the power to be able to deal with our sin and create in us that good fruit. You are the only one who ever got over the bar and you're the only way for us to get over that bar as well. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for Jesus Christ who saved us. So we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. I encourage you to stay, connect with one another. The books are out on the back table. Again, suggested donation of $4 will cover the cost of the book. Take one for your family. If you don't get one today, we'll order some more, but I'll need to know by Tuesday at noon.